Well, thank you for asking me to come and talk to you today. Um, I've been given the title, The Highs and Lows. I think I'm going to be talking to you about the lows, actually, um, and where the highs should be. Um, I was on the Select Committee for National Policy for the Built Environment, and one of the things that we became very aware of when we looked at healthcare was the importance of the environment and the impact on healthcare itself. And the environment itself makes a difference to patient outcomes. Uh, why do we do so badly in this country? Why have we got such appallingly poor maternal and uh, neonatal birth, um, death rates? Now, there was the Ockenden report, and that was really uh, pointing a finger. But I know of a new hospital that's been built, just opened, where the maternity unit windows look into the ICU. So the women in labor can look through, in, through into the ICU and see patients being intubated. It's completely inappropriate. That maternity unit apparently has no cupboards. So the incubators have to be stored in the corridors. This is in a new hospital. There is no room for the staff to go and chill out in for five minutes, no downtime. So they have to wait until they're on their break. Now that is bound to demoralize staff. Sometimes you need to just go into a corner. I used to say to my clinical team, when you go and cry in the broom cupboard, you can be sure somebody's been in there and cried in there before you. It's really important to have these kind of spaces built in, but they're not there. And that is a new hospital. And I'm now hearing of doctors who say they want to come and work in South Wales, but they don't want to work at, you can guess which hospital it is, I'm not gonna name it. We know that green spaces promote healing, we know that light is really important. This type of room is absolutely disastrous for your long-term health. It has no windows, it has no fresh air, it's recycling coronavirus beautifully for us, so it's our ancient air conditioning system. Um, visually, I think this arch is quite pleasing, but the rest of it at that end is pretty hideous. Um, and the electronic sounds we've already been exposed to. Now, if you are lying in a hospital bed, it's bad enough when you're visiting, hearing beep, 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 beep. The alarm's going off all the time because somebody's drips blocked or whatever. It's a nightmare. No wonder patients are sleep deprived in hospital. And we know that sleep deprivation is a form of torture. It's actually used as a way of torturing people. And yet we do it to our own patients all the time. And that's because we have these environments which are completely inappropriate. So we need to be able to sleep and we need some privacy. And it's really difficult to go to the toilet on a commode in the middle of a ward behind a curtain. Hands up everyone in this room who has tried to poo on a commode behind some curtains in a ward. None of you have. Okay, the next time you do any NHS design, I suggest that you walk in and think, how would I poo on this if A, I was a bit constipated, or B, even worse, I've got smelly diarrhea. Okay, and you can't get to the loo, and there's only one loo, and somebody else is in it. Not good. So this is our current NHS environment. It's completely overcrowded, as you can see. Is it good for infection control? Well, obviously not. It's actually quite dangerous because you can see the wires, you know, the, the wire coming off from the pump attached. Well, that's a great way for somebody to trip. And then you've got another casualty with a broken hip on the floor as well, apart from the stuff you've got going on. And in our vastly overcrowded A&Es, at the moment, you've got so many people with acute psychiatric disturbances that actually this type of environment's really dangerous for them. This was the delightful outlook from a ward that used to look out onto a garden. But as you can see, that is 
I mean, that's actually waiting for some kids to come along and paint something on it, isn't it? But, but this, is, this is a ward outlook. This is what our hospitals look like at the moment because they are so overcrowded. Have any of you been into an emergency department in the last month? Yeah? Was it empty? No. Did it have enough staff? No. And is this a personalised care environment? We've got a problem. We've had this mantra that things will be looked after in the community, but of course we don't have the staff in the community. So basically, you'll get put in your own home and dumped. We don't have enough beds in the system. We have far fewer beds than the rest of Europe. And so we've got quite a crisis. But there's nothing private about a conversation here. How are you going to tell somebody about what's going on? I heard an anecdote, well, it was an anecdote, it was a real, it's a story, um, from somebody that happened in the last few weeks. A, a, cute, a patient, very sick, with an acute abdomen on a trolley. Because of COVID, they were short of staff, so only three doctors where there should have been six. Acutely disturbed psychiatric patient going around because they'd got seven psychiatric patients and only one mental health nurse there. And this patient on the trolley was saying to the doctor, oh, I think that other woman over there, she was all right five minutes ago. I think she's playing up, doctor. I think you can probably ignore her. You know, should the patients be that managing of the whole environment? It's a disaster. At which point, also, the poor doctor slipped on something on the floor and fell over. But I had to keep on working. These are our delightful waiting rooms. This was a pre-COVID picture, obviously, because in, now in COVID, every third chair would have some yellow sticky tape on it. I mean, we've managed the estate so badly that we haven't even taken the chairs out. So now, all of our waiting areas have got only one out of three chairs that you can sit on, because if you sit on the others, you're either going to come up with a bit of yellow sticky tape on your bum, or your clothes are going to stick to where the sticky's oozed out from the side of the tape onto the chair. And we call that a therapeutic environment. So during COVID, we didn't even take the opportunity to do it right. So some seats have got those bits of, you know, um, like the police cordon tape strapped over them. But that's the environment. And this is one department that I want to tell you about. This is an emergency department in London. The toilets have not flushed for seven years. For the staff to have a wee, they have to leave the department. And that has gone on, and that's what the estates department in that hospital have just allowed to carry on. They have to hot desk in tiny offices, five of them in an office which is probably about two of those rosettes along the square, and they're hot desking in there. That's not a good environment to get people to work well. To eat, they have to go and eat in the areas where their patients and relatives and other people are. So they can't debrief and have a private conversation. There was this decision many years ago to strip out the doctor's dining room and the nurse's dining rooms. I think for morale, that was a really stupid decision. It was based on some sort of political idea that everybody should mix in and be equal. But if you've looked after something really traumatic, you need to be able to talk to somebody about it. And you can't maintain confidentiality if on the next table might be the friends of the person that you've just had a terrible situation arise with. So we've actually made it worse for the staff, not better. In this department, when you go in behind to go up to where the doctor's offices are, there's a, like a fire escape staircase 
Underneath it, broken wheelchair and some old Zimmer frames dumped. And they'd been dumped there because the, the pads off the end of the Zimmer frame on one side have come off and on the wheelie one, one of the wheels has come off. And they're just left there. And that's what we call management of the estate. I think it's shameful. And the worst thing of all is that it's just accepted. The hospital board have accepted that the staff can't we. The hospital board have accepted that the staff can't eat and drink while on duty somewhere privately and quietly. They can get sandwiches from a machine. That is madness cost cutting. During COVID, we saw picture after picture, didn't we, on the television of crowded areas, ICUs, wards converted into ICUs. And then, of course, we had all of those, uh, what were they called, the Nightingale hospitals, which never did anything. So I'm putting out a challenge to you that actually we are now inheriting decades of really bad practice. And so it isn't just about how do we go forwards, but if we don't look after and do something about what we've already got and do it urgently, we're really not going to improve things. Does it have to be like this? I'd suggest to you, no, it doesn't. I was lucky enough to have a visiting professorship for a couple of years in this city. Does anybody know where it is? Recognize it from the aerial view? I wouldn't expect you to actually. It's in the north of Holland and it's Groningen. And in Groningen, they had to rebuild their hospital some years ago now, and they built the university hospital. What they did was they consulted the whole city, everybody, repeatedly, about what people wanted from the hospital. All the staff at every grade were repeatedly involved. It was a dynamic discourse with people with specialties about what was going on. There was an old shopping mall, which is these, if you could, there's that and that, okay? And they decided that that was a good plot of land to take over. And they built the hospital in there having consulted repeatedly and had different models and had dynamic models, people could come and, and discuss and move things around. And they created the big atrium. So now when you go in through that front door that I've shown you, this is what you go into, which is a very open waiting area. Out of sight about where I'm standing is a nice flower shop and card shop and things like that the type of thing that you see in most hospital entrances now. When you look up, they've used artwork to create a, a very pleasant environment. They've looked at the symbols of things that say something. This is genetics. So this is obviously the chromosome outside in the sculpture and they've used the building, and then this is a picture at night of the way that the folds on the outside light up to create a pleasant environment. As you walk down the main street of a hospital, and I would have to say, I think the best thing about any hospital is its street, because that's where you meet people. So the hospitals I've worked in, Clandoc Hospital, has got a very long street. It's quite good for keeping fit. But you do meet your colleagues as you go down there, and that becomes important for just saying, oh, can you just, can I just ask you a question? Damn. Lots of information gets exchanged like that. Belinda, where I've worked recently as a cancer center, again, had a very good street. It's been split up a bit, and it doesn't work quite as well as it used to, and interestingly, the cohesiveness amongst the consultant group has gone down a bit. And I think it's because they're not always encountering each other as they go down the street. They've used sculpture and artwork 
to enhance the environment, but also to signal where things are. This is the medical staff room where they can go. These are desks where staff can go, hot desk, looking at computers. A really pleasant environment. Note the healthy eating. Not a box of chocolates, but a basket of apples for staff. This is in the main street of the hospital. The fountains, and then I'm gonna show you, this is what it's like at night. And this area is an open cafeteria. And when you go past there, you'll see really sick patients in wheelchairs with their drips up or whatever with their family having coffee. There is a normalization of living with illness while you're there being treated. And this open area around the fountains. The lift shafts are remarkably uncluttered. Um, again, using artwork on the walls. Please note the lack of notices on the walls. There is no sellotape. There is no blue tack. And there are not notices put up everywhere. If people need to communicate, they have to do it by talking to somebody or communicating properly. I, I hate emails, but that's a different story, but they are used vastly. This is in the staff canteen, uh, which is also open to the public, but it's got staff areas and other areas. And note, it gives out onto a green space here. You can go and sit out there in the summer when it's pouring with rain. You see that it's pouring with rain. You're in touch with the weather with nature while you have something to eat. How different to the majority of our hospital canteens where at best you look out onto a car park. And outside the canteen, there is this area with plants which is kept going. I'm sorry some of the photos are not the most brilliant quality, but that gets down to my, uh, my camera. I won't say which telephone it was on. But it was an old one and I've still got it. And this again is going, this is as you go towards, this is the entrance at night to the staff canteen area. So they close down a lot of the kitchen areas, but they still have places where right through the night staff can go and get something to eat, which is not a curled sandwich in a plastic packet out of the machine. It's better food than that. And just to show that it worked during COVID, this was one of their wards during COVID, where they've got a lot of single rooms. They had a lot of equipment obviously out in the corridor then because of all the problems of infection control. The other thing that they've got, uh, if I just show you, this is the entrance to radiotherapy. Uh, you, it's a bit dark as a slide, so you can't see it terribly well. Again, there's remarkably little. Look at look how few notices there are. In the UK, those glass panels would have probably been covered with bits of blue tack and notices telling you what you can and can't do. We're very good in the UK at saying, don't this, don't that, don't the other. But actually, you don't need any of it because nobody ever reads notices anyway. Um, unless it's got a picture of a party on it for the staff, and then sometimes people will read it. But we are, we're obsessed with thinking that we can put a notice up somewhere and not thinking about how do we communicate properly within our buildings. The other thing that they've done is they've used sculpture for signage. So uh, the um, chest, um, lung, oh, got pulmonology department has got two big perspex lungs uh, as a sculpture on the wall. The paediatric department has got lots of toys around. Uh, gastroenterology has got a great big gut with a stomach in one color. It's got a bit of small intestine in another color. 
huge sculpture on the wall in perspex, modern art used to signal where to go. So much nicer than trying to find which label is it for gastroenterology and so on. Um, so there's, look, they've used a huge amount of imagination and they've in, incorporated the humanities, the art side into this and they've also thought about sound so that you don't have echoey spaces, you don't overhear other people's conversations because in the design the place has been done well. So I think that brings me to the end of what I was, I'll go back one actually, to there. And obviously because I'm, my background's in palliative medicine so I have always had a lot to do with radiotherapy departments one way or another. Um, but the other thing is you can't, I think you can probably see in the background there's a spiral staircase up and they've got a really nice meeting room above the department. So people working in the department can go up for their team meetings and so on and go down again and it's their room and because it's their room they take pride in it and they look after it and if you have an environment which is well looked after people carry on looking after it we all know that don't we we all know that if there's litter people will drop litter but if it's kept clean and tidy they don't and that's one of the most striking things everywhere looks absolutely spotlessly clean if you go around most UK hospitals you actually find that they're quite dirty in places that's the clostridium uh, infection stuff that people have done going into wards and swabbing and so on to find out what's going on so um, I'm just throwing open to you the challenge that we don't have to carry on doing what we've always done I think in this country, if I might say, that we're too arrogant to learn from our other places abroad, and we should do. We need to look at what places, particularly in Europe, have done. Some places in America, some of the big university hospitals there, but they put a lot more money into it than in Europe. In France, simple buildings with as inpatient units are actually quite pleasant. They've got a little bit more space around the bed, a little bit quieter, and they manage things like where the food trolleys go and so on better than we do. And I think we should also go and look at Germany. Um, Belgium is a little bit crowded out and probably not as good, but if anyone's interested in hospital design, go and look at Groningen before you do anything else. And it's a wonderful city to have a holiday in at the same time. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that fantastic presentation. I think it's, it's really key in informing digital strategy just to make sure we are aware of what we're trying to achieve in terms of better patient outcomes and better staff outcomes. And we've got to keep focused on that, whether we're designers, con contractors, estates people or even technologists, it's got to be focused on making the NHS better. Why wouldn't we? We're, you know, we're all contributing to it after all.